So if you're new with us, we go verse by verse uh, through the Bible every other week between the Gospel of John and Romans right now. Um, We've come to Romans chapter 5, and we left off at verse 12, and I've titled this, From Death to Life. It is Communion Sunday, so we're going to take communion together as a church family, and I don't think we should take communion lightly, like it shouldn't just be a ceremony that we rush through, that, I mean, the Bible, the Apostle Paul says to examine yourself, uh, examine your heart, and I don't think that just means that we should confess our sin, but I also think our hearts should be grateful, we should be thankful, we should realize the magnitude of what Jesus Christ has done to forgive our sins. And we're going to see that today in these verses. So last time we were in Romans, we were very encouraged because the verses told us because we put our faith in Jesus that we have access to God's peace, His grace, His hope, His love, His security, and His joy. And now Paul turns and he says, he just talks about the magnitude of how Christ saved us from our sin. And what he does here, he's going to talk about how one man's actions plunge this entire world, universe if you will, into sin. But the other man's actions saved us from our sin saved us from eternal death. So this is what we're going to talk about this morning. So I want to break it down and give you three points before we take communion together. And first of all, let's talk about how, number one, death comes from Adam. Death comes from Adam. Verse 12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin was Adam's sin, is the reason we all die. And so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over those who were sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Adam was a special human being. The first man wasn't born. God created him. And and another man would come in the future, he's saying there. And of course, that's Jesus Christ. Now, Paul's been dealing with these people that think you can get saved by keeping the law. And that's why he throws that in there, that death was happening. People were dying before the law was given. And what does that mean? It just means you don't become a sinner when you sin. You sin because you are a sinner. You were born a sinner. David said, I was sinful in my mother's womb. So we we all inherit this sin from Adam, and now there is death. Hebrews 9, 27 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. I like that word, appointed. You've got an appointment with death. God already already knows, God already sees your death on his calendar. Unless Christ returns in the rapture of the church, and I'm looking forward to that. I hope that happens. But if that doesn't happen in our lifetime, we are destined to die. Uh, Scripture says in uh, Ezekiel, the soul that sins will die. And every soul sins. Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, 
There's a time to be born, and there is a time to die. You can't deny it. I mean, our world is filled with graves. No matter how rich you are, no matter how important you are, no matter how famous you are, death comes for you. I, was, I, Googled, I Googled, I was going to try to see how many people died, uh, you know, recently, and I ended up at, they have a, on Google, you can Google it, it's called a death clock, you know, if you, if you have time to waste, go look at the death clock. And the death clock says, it, it said, it's, it's counting down, and already over 10 million people have died this year. And as you're looking at the death clock, it just, it keeps adding to the number every second, every second, every second, every snap of the fingers, someone is dying. And the painful reality is death captures mankind without exception and sometimes without warning when we're not ready for it. So this is death is pretty much our greatest enemy and sometimes our greatest fear. And by the way, this is true science, okay? True science. And, and the Bible is always scientific. And the Bible tells us that we've sinned and we're all going to die. And the world will kind of admit that somewhat, but, they, but the world doesn't want to admit that God is also telling the truth that not only do you die physically, but you die spiritually, meaning you will be separated from God for all of eternity because of your sin. Religion can't fix that. You're, you can't cover up your sin with good human works. How many rotten eggs ruin an omelet? One. How many sins will get you to hell? One, even though you've got billions of them you're not even aware of. So we, death came in, sin and death came into the world when Adam and Eve sinned. Of course, the world uh, doesn't want to believe the story of Adam and Eve. Um, they mock it. They look at it as mythology. So they're the smart ones. They believe nothing exploded. They believe that we evolved from monkeys. And there is no scientific evidence whatsoever for any of that. And we got all these young people believe in this stuff as they go to these schools and learn this, that they've evolved from monkeys. And no wonder they're acting like monkeys. But this is true science, and this explains why, and I get a a question as a pastor all the time, if God is powerful, if God is good, why is there pain and suffering? Why do people that we love die? And the answer is this, right here in Scripture, It's because of sin. It's because of sin. That's why everybody's going to die. That's why everybody suffers. That's why there's tornadoes and diseases. And that's why there's the law of entropy, second law of thermodynamics. Everything is dying down. The universe is dying down. People are dying. You're not evolving. You, you You are devolving. And this is the truth of the Bible. So I refer to this a lot, but I want to look at the story today, since it's in our text, about Adam's sin. So Genesis 2, 15 through 17, this is after God created Adam, put him in a perfect environment. And verse 15 says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. It's paradise, heaven on earth. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Man, Adam's in paradise. He's got one rule, and he couldn't even keep the one rule and blown it for all of us, right? 
And I want to tell you right now, this was not an apple, okay? This is something way beyond that, folks, okay? And yes, this was God giving man a choice, a choice to love God, to obey God, to enjoy God and all that God had given him. And of course, we see that man chose to disobey. So let's look at that sin. Let's look at it in the next chapter we read, Genesis 3. I wish I could go into all of it, but I can't. But I want you to see the sin. Uh, Chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. First of all, first thing we got to do is I got to point out to you, this was not a talking snake, not a talking snake. Whatever this creature was, okay, it was it was something that Eve was captivated with. I believe it's very possible Adam and Eve could use 100% of their brains. I believe they could do things we have no idea. And I believe it's possible that they could communicate with the animals. And that's why this was not that far-fetched. But that's speculation. So let me say this. We know she could talk to this one. And we know that this serpent, whatever this creature was was possessed by Satan. And Eve was intrigued with this creature. Man, God's creatures are so amazing, even after the curse. The things that the creatures that God has made, the animals, just think about what they were like before the curse and what they're going to be like on God's new earth. But she was fascinated with this serpent. And And Satan, through the serpent, says, did God actually say, you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? Did God really say that? Just putting a little bit of doubt in there. Are you sure? You sure God's telling you the truth? Just like like he does with us. And verse 2, and it says, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, Eve is adding to God's rule. God never said they couldn't touch it. He just said, you can't eat of it. So where did she get you can't touch it? Probably Adam said, whatever you do, don't touch that thing. Because God already said, and she didn't listen. But verse 4 But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Hey, the world says, you're not, you're not, there's no such thing as hell. You're not going to die spiritually. Verse 5, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. So, and you might be thinking, man, all they did was eat a piece of fruit. Listen, they were following Satan instead of God. They wanted This offer of Satan of pride and pleasure. And the lie was, you can be a God yourself. It's the same lie that's still circulating in our world that people fall for. And you might, and as we're reading this, you know, you're thinking, hey, wait a minute. God says it's the man that sinned. Well, what about this woman? She sounds like she got him into trouble, right? And remember what Adam says to God? Hey, it was the woman that you gave me. It's her fault, right? But Adam was created first. Adam 
was the leader. Adam was given that command of God. He was supposed to lead his wife, protect his wife, but he didn't do it. And God holds him responsible for all of sin. And by the way, it's then the man, okay? And then when, when, when Adam and Eve sleep together, it's the man's seed that goes into the woman and that creates another sinner, right? And think about it. When they bit into this fruit, whatever it was, they didn't fall down dead when God said they would die. What happened though? They later on, obviously it affected them because they were kicked out of paradise. But when it really hit them, I always like to tell this because it, it, it's just a powerful result of sin and death is when the first death in the Bible is Cain kills his brother Abel. And I believe when Adam and Eve saw their son, who they loved, lying in a pool of blood, now they knew what their sin had done. Now they knew what death truly was. And they had no idea of the sin and death that was going to spread throughout this entire world. And so this is a very powerful thing that happened. Uh, the good news is, the good news is, we know that Adam and Eve ran from God, hid from God. They covered themselves with fig leaves, right? And that wasn't working because those things were itching, you know. And, but God shows up. And it's a picture of false religion. But God shows up and finds them. And what does he do? He kills an animal, a lamb, and clothes, clothes them in lambskins. Right there is a picture of God's blood sacrifice in the first chapters of the Bible. And God forgave their sins. So we believe Adam and Eve will be in heaven. But death and sin come straight from Adam. Uh, so let's look at the second point. Grace comes from God. As horrible as this sin is, as horrible is what happened to the world and the many people of this world, God's grace is greater than all that. So we read in verse 15, it says, But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of grace that the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Just fancy way of saying, as great as that one sin was that brought sin and death to the world, God's grace and His, His free gift of eternal life just outweighs that. Verse 16, and the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin, for the judgment following the one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. So condemnation means you're cursed, you're damned, you're, you're born in sin, headed to hell. And that's what sin brings. But the free gift of God through Jesus Christ brings you justification. We've talked about it over and over again. Just as if you've never sinned. God doesn't hold your sin against you because he placed your sin upon himself on that cross. Verse 17, for it is because of one man's trespass, death reigned through the one man. Much more will, will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And he uses that word reign as royalty. So he's saying death, death was king. And death is a king that we don't want to bow to, but we have to, every one of us. But Paul is saying through Jesus Christ, he is the king of grace. 
And that king, that king conquered the king of sin and death by dying on the cross. You might you know, there's, there's questions that arise, you know, sometimes when you read these stories and people say, well, if, if God knew Adam and Eve would sin, why would he create them? God knows everything. And of course he did. And because God already had a plan of salvation, God allowed this for his purpose, for his glory. And God allowed Satan to be, Lucifer to become Satan. God allowed Adam and Eve to sin. That plunged this world into death and darkness. God allowed that. Why? So we could see God's glory, God's mercy, God's grace. We wouldn't know what forgiveness is and how beautiful forgiveness is from God unless we sin. So God allowed it. If you, if, you, if you buy your loved one a diamond at the jewelry store and that salesman, he pulls out the diamond and you first look at it and it doesn't look like a big deal. But then the jeweler knows how to sell you. So what he does is he puts the diamond on the black velvet. And when the diamond gets on that black velvet, that dark black color, the diamond just shines with brilliance. It brings all the attention to the beauty of the diamond. And God allowed the darkness so we could see the beauty of his light, of his mercy and his grace. And we wouldn't know what pleasure is without pain. We wouldn't enjoy heaven. You know why we're going to enjoy heaven? Because on earth, it's like we go through hell. And we're going to enjoy heaven and the glory of God. So this was just an incredible act of grace from God. And think about it. You know, one man's sin plunged the whole world and made us all sinners. But yet the one man, Jesus Christ, goes to the cross and he dies for all of all of men's sin, though and those who would believe in him, of course. How could that be? How could one man take on all of, that, all of the sin? And, and how could one man die for eternal hell and take that punishment upon himself? Well, he had to be a man to be the sacrifice in our place. It's the great switcheroo, you know. Uh, he lived a perfect life. We couldn't live in our place. And then he took the punishment we deserve. He had to be the perfect man, but he also had to be God because he would have never survived having eternal sin placed upon him. And it was just an incredible act of God's love, his grace, and his mercy. And that should excite us, folks. And when we take communion, we should never take it lightly again, realizing what Jesus has saved us from. And people of this world have no idea where they're going. They have no idea. And I've said it recently. Man, God's wrath is extreme because He is holy and righteous. And His mercy and grace is extreme. Choose the mercy. Choose the grace. God's grace is greater than our sin. And then number three... And finally, we'll take communion. Death comes from Adam. We talked about that. Verse 3, life comes from Christ. Life comes from Christ. Verse 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so the one act of righteousness 
leads to justification in life for all men. That one act did a lot of damage that Adam did. But the one act of Jesus Christ is greater. And it takes away our sin. And makes us righteous in God's eyes. Verse 19. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. What does that mean? When the law came, when God gave the law, that didn't fix anybody. It just made them sin worse. Oh, we can't do those 10 things? Well, yeah, I'm going to do them then. And that's what the law does. It makes you want to break it. It, 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 just, it just makes sin worse. But the grace of Jesus Christ increases and does what the law can't do. Saves us from sure sin and death. In verse 21 so that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Awesome. And right now, we're still stuck on this sinful planet. So we're still, we're still going to face death. I gotta go, I'm going to go pray with one of my friends from high school who's dying from stomach cancer. And uh, to be honest, you know, I, I mean, I, I first went and saw him. His name's Greg Russell. Pray for him. Um, I first went and saw him, and I didn't know what he would think. You know, I get nervous because I, the pastor's coming. Are they going to be receptive of me? Are they going to want to listen to me? Am I going to get on their nerves? And before I could say anything to him, he said, Frank, will you please pray with me? And so listen, in the midst of his death and his suffering. He is what? Being brought to God. Brought to God. And it's worth it all for him to spend eternity in heaven by putting his faith in Christ, even if it's on his deathbed. And so, what Jesus Christ has done, we we have to just trust him. And it talks about obedience here if you want to know what sin is sin is pride and disobedience the same we want to be god ourselves. we want attention and we don't want to obey god we don't want to obey any laws and our world is becoming lawless lawless people want to eliminate all laws They want to be left alone. And that's why it's getting worse and worse and worse before Jesus is going to come back. So the good news is we get forgiveness even though we're stuck here and still got to deal with the death of our loved ones and our friends. But the next time the king comes, the king of grace who saved us from our sin, he's going to give us a new heaven and a new earth. And those animals are going to be tame again. And people are going to be tame again. And God, God is not letting any sin into his heaven. And people think they're just going to, you know, well, I'm a good person. God doesn't work that way. You are contaminated with sin. And unless you come to Christ, God can't allow you into heaven because it'll mess up heaven. I'm so glad God ain't going to let sin into heaven because it'll be as lousy as earth. And, and so you need that grace. Hey, if you, if you had some kind of disease, you were contaminated with a deathly disease that was going to kill everybody in your family and in the world, you know what they'd do with you? They would qu- quarantine you. They would quarantine you, even though you didn't like it. Why? To save everybody. God is going to quarantine sinners for all of eternity away from him. And so this is a big deal. And this is why us sinners, we need the grace of Jesus Christ. You know, you think about Adam. Adam, he's in a perfect environment. He was the perfect man. 
Um, I grew up in the 70s watching The Six Million Dollar Man. I love that show. And The Six Million Dollar Man, I mean, he was so fast and so strong. He could jump so high and do all these things he could do. They're actually talking about remaking The Six Million Dollar Man. And I guess there's inflation because they're calling it The Six Billion Dollar Man. And it's supposed to star Mark Wahlberg. I'm going to go check that movie out. I don't like it. I want to tell you something. I believe, I really believe that Adam, when God created him, he was beyond the six billion dollar man, whatever that man could do. And who knows what Adam was able to do. And you know, he, he had to name all the animals. His job was to name all the animals. How did he get certain places? How did he get out there in the sea and name all those sea creatures? Well, he couldn't die. And you know he could swim real good. A lot of myths are true. You know, ever see Aquaman? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Superman? No, there's no telling what Adam could do in a perfect environment. He had everything. One rule. But yet... He was disobedient and brought sin and death to this world. But our great King and Savior, Jesus Christ, what a different story. He was obedient. And Adam was a special creation. He wasn't born. He wasn't born. God created him out of the dust, breathed life into him. People say, did Adam have a belly button? I don't know. That's a stupid question. No. <laughs> He wasn't born. I mean, if God wanted to design him one, he could have. Who cares about questions like that, y'all? But he's this perfect man in a perfect environment. But Jesus comes, and he's a special man too. And he wasn't born of the seed of sinful man. Why? Because he couldn't be, or he'd be a sinner. And that's why when God cursed uh, Satan, he said, There's, the woman's seed is going to crush your head. Well, the woman don't have a seed. What seed are you talking about? That was when God put Jesus inside of Mary, the virgin birth. And Jesus was a sinless man. And Jesus didn't have an incredible body like Adam had because he took on the weakness, took on the weakness of, of what happened to man. And Jesus grew weak and he was tired and he was thirsty and he cried and he felt pain and he went to that cross. And in the midst of not being in a perfect environment, in the midst of much suffering throughout Jesus' life, he remained obedient. What a Savior. What a Savior. Uh, Philippians 2.8 says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know, last week, Nathaniel talked about humility. We all need humility. Because humility is the opposite of pride and sin. And Jesus displayed great humility and great obedience. One man ruined us. But this man rescued us. This man rescued us. And we're going to remember him right now as we take communion together. Let me close with this verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Which man do you want to follow? Adam to your death? Or Jesus Christ to eternal life? I choose Jesus Christ all day. I hope you're with me. I hope you're with me. Pray with me now. I'm going to ask our men to get ready to take communion. 
Just pray that you be in a prayerful mode as we pass these emblems. I hope you understand what I was saying. Now that we take communion and we, we see the magnitude of what sin has done, we see the magnitude of Jesus' death on the cross, and so we should want to worship Him and be thankful. We should want to humble ourselves, confess our sin. Well, let's pray, and we'll take these emblems together. If you're new, uh, just hold on to the communion. Once it's all passed out, we'll take it together, okay? Heavenly Father, uh, we thank You for these incredible Scriptures that tell us the truth of where sin and death came from. God, thank you that you're merciful and you're gracious. And when we see that cross, we see your beauty. In the midst of the the darkness, we see the beauty of your light and your love, your mercy and your grace. As we take these emblems, God, I pray that our hearts would be stirred to be thankful to remember. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.